perimenopause isn't really talked about enough, and I think that we're starting to see more conversations happening, which is great, but there's still a lot of ground to cover and a lot of nuance to explore, especially if you're someone who starts experiencing perimenopause symptoms earlier than expected, you can feel pretty left in the dark. We also live in a world where we as women can experience hormonal imbalances for a wide variety of reasons, and these hormone imbalances can sometimes look and feel identical to perimenopause, but they may not in fact indicate or be signs of true perimenopause. So what's the difference? What does it all mean? And how can you tell what's going on in your body so you can start to support yourself the best way possible? Let's talk about it. Hi, I'm Kelsey. I am a certified functional nutritionist, a restorative wellness practitioner, and I help women learn how to heal their gut, age well, and love doing it. If you want more information on gut health, women's health, and healthy aging, go ahead and subscribe to my channel and hit the bell to be notified when I post a new video. In particular, if you think you may be going through early perimenopause, meaning perimenopause that's starting before the age of 44, definitely watch this video, but the tips and info I'm sharing in this video will also be helpful for anyone who's experiencing perimenopause symptoms if you wanna manage them as well as possible and do everything you can to transition through menopause more smoothly. Also, if you're still experiencing some symptoms of perimenopause, even though you're on hormone replacement therapy, it could be a dosing issue that needs to get sorted out with your prescribing physician, or you may have other imbalances that we'll talk about today that are throwing you off. So let's start at the beginning. Generally speaking, it's thought that perimenopause begins around your mid 40s, but it can range in start date from your 30s to your 50s. So that's a wide window and we'll keep that in mind. Oftentimes the age of onset for perimenopause is genetically linked. So if your mom and your grandma started going through this change in their 30s or early 40s, chances are you'll follow suit. But this is where I think it gets interesting and the nuance becomes even more important because perimenopause technically means that the ovaries are beginning to decline in function. Since the ovaries are the seat of sex hormone production for women, this means that we start to experience signs and symptoms of hormonal imbalances during this phase. Another definition I found that I think words it really well is that menopause is the natural and permanent cessation of menses resulting from estrogen deficiency that is not associated with a pathologic process. And of course, menopause is the conclusion of perimenopause. So I think this definition extends to perimenopause being what I will call the gradual cessation of menses resulting from estrogen deficiency that is not associated with a pathologic process. And that's the key here, not associated with a pathologic process, which means that estrogen decline and menstrual irregularities in true perimenopause are not being caused by some other disorder in the body. So this brings us all back to the original question. Are you experiencing true perimenopause? Are your ovaries actually naturally declining in function? Or are you experiencing a hormonal imbalance that looks and feels just like perimenopause, but it is being caused by another disorder or imbalance in the body. And this can be a night and day difference in how you approach this. Irregular periods, missed periods, increased PMS symptoms like moodiness, depression, PMDD, anxiety, heavier periods, lighter periods, shorter cycles, longer cycles, hot flashes, low libido, skin changes, and skin dry dryness, insomnia. These are all symptoms that are very commonly associated with perimenopause. These are also symptoms that can result from hormone imbalances of other causes. So this is why I'm saying it's so hard sometimes to tell the difference, and it's so important to think about and consider the nuance of what the source is if you're having any of these symptoms. So what are some other causes of hormonal imbalance that can mimic perimenopause? So glad you asked. I think of HP access problems, issues with your hypothalamus pituitary access. You may have heard me talk about your HPA access before in an adrenal health video. So your HPA access is the connection between your hypothalamus pituitary and adrenal glands. Well, you have an HPG access as well, your hypothalamus pituitary gonadal access, which is the connection between your hypothalamus and pituitary and your ovaries. And the reason this comes to mind first for me is because it can happen that instead of the ovaries 
losing function, it can actually be the brain signaling pathways that get inhibited and they can't trigger the overlease properly. So your hypothalamus and pituitary are supposed to work together to signal hormone production and sometimes they don't or they can't. HP axis dysfunction can be related to TBIs, traumatic brain injuries, like if you've ever had a concussion. They can be related to a chronically high stress, high anxiety lifestyle. Genetics can play a role in your HP function. Autoimmune disorders that cause systemic inflammation can impact your HP axis. Gut microbiome imbalances or infections that also cause inflammation can impact your HP axis. So these are just some of the issues that can cause hypothalamus pituitary dysfunction that can lead to improper hormone signaling and production that can cause symptoms like perimenopause. So it could be an HPG axis disorder. There can also be a relationship between the thyroid and the adrenals in hormone imbalance, and these both also have their own respective HP axis connections, your HPA and HPT axis. The hypothalamus and pituitary pretty much drive the endocrine system, so they're a really good place to start looking when we have any form of endocrine dysfunction. So hyperthyroidism, which means having an overactive thyroid, has been shown in some studies to impact progesterone levels in premenopausal women, causing progesterone levels to drop prematurely. And this can mean that you have symptoms that mirror perimenopause, specifically hot flashes, low libido, insomnia, mood swings, irregular or heavy periods, but the primary cause is actually a thyroid dysfunction. Hypothyroidism or low thyroid function can also cause some of these symptoms like menstrual irregularities, fatigue, and infertility, but again, the cause is the thyroid and not the ovaries. Thyroid dysfunction can be caused by endocrine stress or it can be an autoimmune condition, and it's not uncommon to unknowingly live with an autoimmune condition for years, only to have symptoms start to present later in life when the right combination of stress and environmental factors happen to fall into place at the right time. Now the adrenals. First, let's cover that when we go through menopause and we are crossing over that bridge, our adrenals are the glands that take over sex hormone production. So if your adrenals and hypothalamus and pituitary aren't healthy and functioning optimally, guess what? You're gonna hit a wall. Like so many other women you may have seen, or you may be experiencing this yourself right now. So supporting these systems now and supporting good adrenal health and really nourishing healthy adrenals is really, really important. I don't think I can emphasize that enough. But specifically with perimenopause symptoms, when you have elevated cortisol, it can actually start to drive down estrogen levels and lead to symptoms like hot flashes, night sweats, dry skin, irritability and moodiness, trouble sleeping, and weight gain, just to name a few. Functional hypothalamic amenorrhea is a symptom of chronic stress and the resulting adrenal HP dysfunction that this causes. It makes you stop getting your period. FHA isn't just caused by emotional stress. It can also be triggered by under eating or intense fasting programs, over exercising, or chronic illness. Low cortisol levels can also cause menstrual irregularities. They can cause fatigue, loss of libido, and a lot of irritability in women. The adrenals are also responsible for DHEA production, which is in turn linked to healthy testosterone and estrogen production. We need both of these hormones, estrogen and testosterone, to be in balance. And if you have adrenal dysfunction, you may have low levels of DHEA, which can lead to low levels of testosterone and estrogen and cause low sex drive and low energy, hot flashes, night sweats, dry skin, all the symptoms we talk about when we talk about low estrogen and perimenopause. So to recap, two big reasons I think HP axis dysfunction is so important for us to talk about are that one, if you're young and you think you're going through perimenopause, it can be helpful and really important for you to consider these other influences first, especially if your goal is fertility and getting back a healthy ovulation cycle. Just boosting your hormones alone is not necessarily going to help you with that, at least not in a truly sustainable way. And even if you're simply interested in managing your symptoms and you're starting to take hormone support and supplements, but maybe you're targeting the wrong things, it's not really going to help in the long run. Um, or or you may have good results at first 
and then they fizzle and then you end up feeling really frustrated and you're still loaded with all these symptoms. And also, number two, like I said before, all of these moving pieces and the HP axis health are critical for anyone's smooth perimenopause and menopause transition, regardless of whether it's being caused by what we're calling a pathologic process or if it is a natural menopause process in your body. Now, there are several other conditions that can cause perimenopause-like symptoms in women. For example, fibroids, endometriosis, PCOS, and ovarian or uterine tumors can all cause a range of symptoms, including menstrual irregularities, fatigue, weight gain, new body hair growth in atypical places, mood swings, and even depression. And again, all of these could be mistaken for symptoms of perimenopause, even though they're caused by a different imbalance in the body. So when it comes to being able to tell what's going on in your body and what's causing your specific hormone imbalance symptoms, it really ultimately comes down to testing. Testing is the best way to start to uncover what the primary cause of your hormonal imbalance is. Is it that natural decline in ovarian function, or is there another issue that's causing the ovaries not to function properly or causing hormonal imbalances in your body? One of the most common test markers you might have heard about for perimenopause is FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. The reason this is used commonly as an indicator of perimenopause is because it's thought to be related to follicle production, which declines in perimenopause, and it's thought to be one of the first changes that happens in the body. FSH is triggered by the brain, and it sends a signal to the ovaries to produce follicles. As ovarian function decreases, ovarian sensitivity to FSH decreases, and the brain production of FSH increases to try to get the ovaries to act. So theoretically, you'll start to see higher and higher levels of FSH without that accompanying elevation of hormones that should be happening in response to it if the ovaries are truly starting to decline in function. It's almost like if you can imagine the brain is yelling at the ovaries to make hormones and the ovaries are like, la la la, I can't hear you, school's out for the summer. And while FSH levels can be a good indicator as to whether or not you're beginning to see a natural decline in ovarian function, every body is different and your FSH might not go up even though your ovarian function may be declining. So FSH can be helpful, but it's not the only indicator you should consider. Definitely make sure you're looking at adrenal markers and thyroid markers as well. In addition to DHEA and testosterone, these can all be related to the HP axis dysfunction we mentioned. And when you're looking at your adrenals, one of the best tests to run is a cortisol test. Doing a cortisol test, make sure you're collecting several samples over the course of a day, usually urine, and you're not just doing a one-off sample. You really wanna see what your full range is and not just get a snapshot of one point in your day. And for thyroid testing, blood work is required for this. Make sure you're looking at all the markers, free T3 and T4, total T3 and T4, TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone and thyroid antibodies. Do a total full workup and don't just rely on TSH or T4 to be a good indicator of what's going on there. On that same note, make sure you're addressing any possible underlying stressors to the endocrine system. Environmental stressors like toxins and exogenous hormones. I mean, we could do a whole other video on those. And of course, chronic emotional stress. These can all be factors that play into hormone production and hormone imbalances. And doing what you can to reduce inflammation in the body, make sure you prioritize gut healing. That will definitely reduce inflammation and it'll help you keep autoimmune symptoms at bay. Also do this so you can can digest and process nutrients that are supportive to the HP axis and the adrenals. So gut health, always important. Also test your sex hormones themselves, including your estrogens, progesterones, and testosterone. And this is best done using a full cycle hormone panel, which can either be urine-based like the Dutch cycle mapping test, or a saliva test like the expanded female hormone panel. If you're still having a menstrual cycle, both of these tests are light years better than any serum blood test they'll do for you in most doctor's offices. It actually kind of blows my mind that someone can think that they they can take a single sample of blood at one point on one day out of a roughly 28 day cycle and say they have a full picture of what your hormones are doing. This is the big difference between a blood test like that 
and the full cycle test for hormones. I like to think of it as like a video versus a screenshot. The full cycle test gives you the video of what's happening in your hormones over the course of a cycle, whereas the blood test captures the screenshot. And it's just that one moment in time that might not be reflective at all of the larger patterns going on. I've had hormonal imbalances since my mid thirties and was actively experiencing perimenopause symptoms like hot flashes and insomnia and PMDD. But the estrogen blood test my doctor ordered came back saying everything was fine when I knew I was not fine and I was suffering. So saliva tests show you the free unbound hormone levels that are available for your body to use, while urine tests show you hormone metabolites that your body has already used. Now, I have a hot take opinion based on my education that saliva tests are superior over urine for women who are still cycling, but really at the end of the day, whichever of these full cycle tests you can get your hands on, it will be so much more beneficial than not testing at all. Look at your full cycle of estrogens, look at your progesterones, look at your FSH and LH and your testosterone and DHEA, look at all the thyroid markers and cortisol markers. And from there, you can start to figure out the best way to support yourself in really effectively managing symptoms of these hormonal imbalances, regardless of their cause. Because once you have all the info from these tests, you can more clearly see, all right, I'm really in natural perimenopause. What are the next steps I need to take to support this? Or wow, I have an underlying adrenal or thyroid issue that's driving my symptoms. How can I address that to get everything back on track? Or maybe you'll find something else. With all of this in mind, it's really hard to say what exactly any one person should do to start to support better hormone health because of all of these various causes. But some excellent starting places are first reducing stress and prioritizing sleep on a daily basis. These are critical for adrenal and overall endocrine health. Make sure you're eating enough, not only to keep your blood sugar stable, but also to provide energy for hormone production. Women especially have a major tendency to undereat and not even necessarily realize it. I think we can thank our unrealistic beauty standards and productivity standards for driving that, I'm sure, anyway. Also in line with this is eat healthy amounts of protein and fat. These are critical for hormone production and also complex carbs and all the nutrients in fruits and veggies. Try to avoid alcohol and refined carbs as much as possible and especially refined sugar, again, for that blood sugar balance. Make sure you're pooping regularly to help your body flush spent hormones so they don't build up and cause imbalances. And lastly, know that it's going to take time to get your body back into balance, at least three months, but probably longer if you have more severe symptoms and or if you've been ex experiencing your symptoms for longer. So be patient and be gentle with yourself and your body. It's not going to be a linear process and sometimes it can feel like you take two steps forward only to take one step back. You just have to give it time. Your hormones are this delicate balancing act and the more you can do to be supportive of yourself so that you can be consistent with your efforts, the more progress you'll end up seeing over time. So that's all. I just think this is really important to talk about and get more clarity on because it's something I've gone through and am going through where I've started to have perimenopause symptoms and I thought I was going into early perimenopause when I was 35 and so I started to try to do all this stuff and take all these supplements and doing all this testing to try to start to balance out my hormones and it wasn't really working. I wasn't supporting myself the right way and I wasn't looking at the right tests because it turns out it's so much more nuanced than that. For me, it really has had more to do with my adrenals and hypothalamus and maybe not my ovaries, possibly my thyroid. I just ordered some new blood work, so we'll see. So if this information can help anyone else out there who's going through something similar, I'm just so happy I could help. Of course, ask me any questions you have in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer. If you liked this information and wanna learn more about supporting your health naturally and building the right habits for aging well as a woman, definitely make sure to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell to be notified when I post a new video. I've also linked some helpful resources down below, so make sure you check those out. And if you could, please give us a like on this video. It helps out my channel a lot. So if you could give it a thumbs up, and share it with your friends. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to hydrate and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.